I will sing of the goodness of God that he gave me a great woman of God. I'm allowed to say that in church, right? Especially during Valentine's week, February 14th. Did anybody else celebrate? I was on my knees on February 14th giving her a rose. What were you guys doing? Come on, guys. Just because I'm a Latino, I grew up in Latin America, we appreciate romance. God is the father of romance. Okay, okay. I'm hearing some yeses here at the front. I love it. Thank you, Marilyn. You are such a blessing to so many. She's a gifted, gifted musician. She plays violin. She's a piano teacher, orchestra conductor. Amazing lady. Uh, tell you a little bit about our testimony. We uh, both really came to Lord and came to mission as teenagers. And today we're going to be focusing on teenagers and our role as a church in releasing teenagers to mission. When Marilyn was 16 and I was 18, we were recruited by Youth for Christ to go on a mission trip to the West Indies, to the Caribbean for one month. And if you've ever been on a mission trip, you know you have to fill in a long form and you get references and they tell you what you like, what you don't like, your favorite scripture, your testimony. All 26 of us on the team, it turned out we all like to sing. But there was one 16-year-old on the trip that on their resume, on their form, they said, I've actually taken a course in choral conducting. So the Youth for Christ guy, very smart, very wise, says, huh, we can put together a choir led by a 16-year-old. How old? 16. And so Marilyn was recruited to put together a choir. And the fun part about that story is, how many of you have ever been in a choir or an orchestra? Anybody been in a choir or an orchestra? Yes. You can be proud of that, by the way. I saw some little hands going like, come on. If you've been in a choir or orchestra, you know that what the conductor, what the choir director says over and over and over again, it's actually despairing how much they say it. They say, pay attention. Watch me. Watch me. I realized I could do that the rest of my life. <laughs> and here we are, 39 years later. I've been dating the same girl for 39 years, and 37 of those we've been married. By God's grace and Marilyn's grace. Huh? Yeah, guys, let's be honest, right? So a family picture. I think we have a family photo up there. So that's our family. We have four wonderful children. We've got a daughter-in-law. We've got a girlfriend of one of our sons. Um, by the way, both of our sons are taken because I was told if I needed to come find a good wife, that's Kenyatta University. <laughs> no? I, I, that's what I heard. That's what I've been told, and I believe I hear true things in church. And that's what I heard. So, but anyway, those two boys are taken. My two daughters are dating very seriously. Wonderful, wonderful young men. Our testimony, part of our testimony is we were told by medical doctors, my apologies to any medical doctors in the room, that we would never have any babies. Here we are four babies later. I actually went back to that doctor and I said, Doc, if you don't shut this down after four, we're going to have to sue you for the cost of raising these babies. It's very expensive, raising kids. And now the big news is, on top of this, those two girls, my two daughters, are the first girls in the Rendell family, my side of the family, in, listen to it, 100 years. Yeah, what? Exactly. My grandpa, my dad's dad, had three sisters born in 1901, 1902, 1903. Our first daughter was born in 2003. We just broke a 100-year dry spell of no women in the Rendell family. So, <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you look very carefully at this picture, there's a little tiny person. Her name is Elizabeth Joy. We lost a great Elizabeth last year, didn't we, Queen Elizabeth? Part of my story was, this is for another sermon some other time, I was her bodyguard for a season in Canada when I was a policeman. So we lost a great Elizabeth, so we're raising up a new great Elizabeth, little, little Elizabeth Joy, our new granddaughter. Mm-hmm. And the first day I was in the hospital holding my little grandbaby, and I was dancing with her, because of course the first dance she ever has should be with her grandpa, right? So I'm dancing with her a little bit, and I realized, oh my goodness, I'm now married to a grandmother. <laughs> and when I said that to her, she's like, right back at you, Grandpa. So uh, speaking of age, Pastor Steve, I need to say something, because you got some bashing up here about this age thing. Pastor Steve and I are the youngest people in the room in, in a really significant way. This is biblical. We're preaching scripture. You ready? Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly... We are being renewed day by day. I'm the youngest man in the room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Huh? Huh? Yeah, he's just getting younger and younger every day. And acting like a 13-year-old boy sometimes. I do the same, you know, junior high kids. Well, 
It is an honor to be with you guys. And Pastor, thank you for your warm welcome. Church, thank you for your welcome. And Shem, thank you for hosting us here as Youth for Christ. Now, I want you, uh, hopefully some of you are taking notes. Some people say when Jordan Rendell preaches, it's like taking a drink from a fire hose. So I'm going to give you a lot of information. You won't be able to digest it all now. Digest it later. Listen to it now. Let the Lord speak to your heart. But I want you to write down a number. And Shem is going to love that I'm asking you to do this because this is his whole job portfolio, missions portfolio. This is his preoccupation. This is what keeps him up at night, gets him fundraising, gets him on his knees. Here's your number. Are you ready for it? 13 million. 13 million. That's a lot of zeros if you're actually writing the zeros out. 13 million. That's how many teenagers there are in Kenya. And I'm here today to talk about teenagers because I'm Youth for Christ. There are two billion teenagers on planet Earth. That's almost one quarter of the Earth's population are teenagers. And do you think God has a plan for them? Come on. I, I need to hear it louder. Do you think God has a plan for teenagers? Indeed, he does. Indeed, he does. Many of us came to the Lord when we were teenagers. I found Jesus as a teenager, and I found a Jesus that didn't just save me and thank God for his salvation. But he loved me enough to save me and send me. You catch that? Save, and that's what gets teenagers excited about the gospel. They don't want the gospel to just be a ticket to glory. They want to know, what do I get to do now for the king who saved me? And the king who saved me said, you get to co-mission with me. You know the Great Commission? That's mission together with me. And I love the Great Commission because it says, go ye into all the world, and I will be Emmanuel. And I will be with you. He goes with us. And we were singing about Ebenezer. Marilyn was playing a song about Ebenezer. He is a faithful God. He's faithful enough to say, I believe in you, and I want to travel with you on mission. I love, by the way, your, your motto's up here, go. I love that word, go. I'm a fairly active character. I like going for runs. I like going hiking to the top of big mountains. What does go stand for? G-O. It means get out. It means get out. My dad is an evangelist, a missionary. We grew up in Latin America. And my dad always said, to try to do evangelism in here, in the church, is like trying to tell the Argentina national football team, soccer team, get ready for the World Cup in an elevator. That's really tough to do. You need to get out on the pitch. This isn't the pitch, I'm just telling you. I love the church. God loves the church. It's out there. It's out there. And we can come in here and get all excited about Jesus and say, Jesus, I love you, and Jesus, thank you for loving me. I was at a big conference where I went, so after we did a lot of that, I said, so what? And this, the guy who invited me is like, whoa, whoa, where's this guy going? And I said, so what? I mean, this is awesome, glorious that we have a love affair with Jesus, and he has a love affair with us, but there's so many people outside these walls that have no clue. And that's why we're here. That's why we're still here on planet Earth. I've done a lot of research on this. I've asked missiologists. I've asked pastors, theologians. Why are we still here? Why don't we just go home? Once you say yes to Jesus, woo, I'm out of here. It's evangelism. And teenagers have a role in that. Now, I love the fact that you are audacious agents of change. Anybody agree with that? Audacious agents of change. By the way, a good synonym for audacious is bold. Write this down if you're writing stuff down. Our boldness in evangelism is directly proportional to our gratitude. How grateful are you for what God has done in your life? And if you understand the grace of God, you're going to be even more grateful. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. The more grateful we are, the more bold we will be. So today, I want to get us excited about standing with teenagers on mission. Marilyn and I have traveled all over the world, lived in nine countries, worked with Youth for Christ on behalf of teenagers. My dad, when I was a boy, growing up in Colombia, South America, during the cartel years, the narco years in Colombia, in Medellin, my dad would send me into prison with him because he was the director of prison fellowship all over Latin America. So every weekend of my childhood, I was in jail, just visiting, just in case you're wondering. But what a place to learn about God's grace. What a place to learn about God's grace. For God so loved the, how much of it? It's not a trick question. All of it. For God so loved teenagers. How many of them? I'll give you a Kenyan question. How many teenagers does God love in Kenya? 
13 million. Pastor, you have a blessed congregation. They're actually listening. This is a good thing. 13 million. I want us to turn to Scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 4. And in this Scripture, this is a wonderful couple of books. First and Second Timothy are the story of mentorship. And I love that we've had a lot of mentorship stories already up on stage as we have interns growing in the Lord, growing in leadership, growing in followership. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But 1 Timothy 4.12 is where I want to turn. Uh, real quickly, as, I, as you turn in your Bibles, I want to ask you a question. How many of you, this is a very, very, very sensitive question. You don't need to raise your hand because it could be embarrassing. How many of you have ever had a love letter written to you? No, don't raise your hand. Okay, it could be kind of awkward. And if you've ever had a love letter written to you, what did you do with it? You read it real quickly and then you scrumpled it up and chucked it. Threw it away. Just rubbish. No? No, some of you have had love letters and I can tell. So when you get a love letter, you read it real quickly and then you read it real slowly. And then you start showing it to friends like, oh, look what she said to me. And then you do this with it. Because her hands touched it. Woo! And then you fold it up and you put it in your pocket and you read it on the bus. You put it under your pillow and then, oh my goodness, it went through the laundry. And you put scotch tape on it. You fix it. Well, I'm here to tell you that this is the strangest love letter ever written, but that's what it is. Do we treat it like that? Do we carry it with us in our hearts wherever we go? Do we read it on the bus? Do we share it with our friends? 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. This is an age-old verse. You've seen this verse a hundred times. And it often gets preached at teenagers. But I'm here to share it with the church. Multi-generational church. Written by Paul to a young Timothy. It has an explicit message to young people. Because it's written by an older guy to a younger guy. So explicit. Straight up message to young people. But an implicit message to the church, capital C and little c. Does anybody know the difference between capital C and little c? Capital C church is the global church, the body of Christ around the world. Little c is you here in this particular body of Christ representation here at your church. This is a very sad verse for the church. Does anybody figure out why it's a sad verse for the church? Because the presumption of Paul is that we look down on young people. Paul says, to Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you. In other words, don't let that bother you. Just carry on and set an example. So we as a church are being called up by this verse. Let us not look down on young people. And it's not to say we need to look up to young people necessarily, but let's at least be willing to include them as equal partners in building God's church. Can I say that again? Let's be willing to include them as equal partners in building God's church. Teenagers. We're going to keep unpacking that. And I love that Paul is very encouraging to his young leader. And that's part of the role of the church is to encourage these young people. Listen carefully to this. One of our roles as the church is to learn from the godly example of young people. Did you hear that? So when you look at the verse carefully, it doesn't say, be an example to your peers. Yes, they need to be an example to their peers, our Christian young people that represent your church. But it's also to the children in your church and children out there, but also to us as adults. In fact, I need to confess, one of the reasons I'm 57 years old and still in youth ministry, it's selfish because they teach me so much. I love learning from young people. They challenge me. They stretch me. They stretch my faith. They stretch my boldness because they believe. They just get out there and do it. They're not tainted by naysayers or troubled by budgetary restraints. Say, we don't have a budget for that. If God calls a teenager to do something, they just go do it. They, don't, they have the faith of a child and the strength of an adult. Mix that together. That's a powerhouse. It's amazing what young people can do. So let's unpack this. Again, another verse, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Paul goes on to say, Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. One of the roles of the church is to help teenagers discover their gifts. A Youth for Christ guy discovered young Marilyn had a gift in music and released it and fanned it into flame. And Marilyn's testimony, she said, I had practiced piano and violin getting up at four in the morning, five in the morning, six in the morning, hours and hours every day. And as a child, I wondered, what's the point of all this? What am I doing all this for? And suddenly a YFC guy representing the church says, I'm releasing you into an opportunity to fan your gift into flame and, and bless the kingdom of God. And that's what drew her in 
to mission long term. We as a church are called to help a generation to fan into flame the gift of God that is within you. 2 Timothy 1.6. Again, this conversation with Paul and Timothy. Fan into flame the gift of God. You, you've all seen fires be, fla- be fanned, right? We also need to be this kind of fan, right? You go, generation. You go, young people. We need to cheer them on. As I arrived here, I thought, I'm going to Google, what's the best place to work in Kenya? You know, best places to work, best places to eat, all those categories. And I don't know, on this particular list, it said the best place to work is DHL. What does DHL do? Ah, they deliver. They're a courier service. So my question as I saw that, I was like, okay, what is the church delivering to this generation? Are we delivering the truth that God has a plan for them too? And the part of God's plan for them is to minister to me, to the rest of the church. It gets powerful. If you start unpacking that, it gets a little bit exciting. Uh, We lived in Buenos Aires for many years. Buenos Aires is a tiny little village of 17 million people. Nairobi's five, if you want a sense of scope and scale. And the first day I was there, a buddy invited me to come and just be a part of a pastor's breakfast. There were 400 pastors at this pastor's breakfast, and it was a prayer time. And partway through the meeting, I was just there visiting first week in Buenos Aires, moved my family down there. And suddenly, a man goes running up on stage, and he taps the speaker. The speaker is the general secretary of the, of the Evangelical Council of Churches for All of Argentina. He says, hey, pastor, the Youth for Christ guy's in here. I, I could hear, it went through the mic. I actually heard it. It was in Spanish. And so the guy goes, hey, Youth for Christ guy. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know my name. But he said, if you're Youth for Christ, you need to come up here. So I went up there, and he says, so, Youth for Christ, we love you. We love what you want to do for teenagers. How do we reach a generation of Argentine teenagers with the gospel? He just handed me the mic. That was spur of the moment. I wasn't ready, but always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. The hope that is within you is that I serve a God who trusts teenagers to be part of his mission. And so the first thing I did is I dropped to my knees. I dropped to my knees. Now, one of the reasons, church, that I love Kenya is because I'm a marathon runner. I'm a marathon runner. And and you guys have an unfair advantage because you have lions. And I looked it up, but lions run faster than grizzly bears. We have grizzly bears in Canada, but they're slow compared to a lion. So that's why you have fast runners. But my heart was broken this week because of this story. Kelvin, a young man at the very, very top of his game, not just the top of his game, the top of humanity's game. This guy, fastest man on the planet. Unbelievable potential. Let me ask you a question. If you hear this sound, what are you hearing? God has called us as his church to be spiritual paramedics. And I'm here to tell you, we've studied this all over the world. The number one form of evangelism, the number one most effective form of evangelism to reach teenagers with the gospel is teen-to-teen evangelism. It's when one Christian teen reaches out to his peer and says, I love Jesus, how about you? It's powerful. Your pastor and I, we can rally them, get them all excited, and they can raise their hands and get excited. And that works. I'm not saying that doesn't work. But the most effective way, and the reason for this, by the way, one of them is, well, there's two parts. One is the other teenagers watching the testimony of the Christian teenagers. And the second part is there's follow-up, natural follow-up, because he's my buddy. I go to school with him. I know where he is. So we work together to raise up a generation. So God bless Kenya. Anybody excited about God blessing Kenya? I am. (laughs) So as I travel the world, I often hear people despairing about teenagers. Like, it's rough. There's some tough stuff going on around the world. And uh, when I get anxious, anybody here ever been anxious? We're not supposed to be anxious about anything, but instead by prayer and supplication. So Marilyn and I, uh, I know none of you, uh, this is confession time. Confession, by the way, is good for the soul, bad for the reputation. Okay, but I'm going to go there anyway. Um, I know none of you as couples, as married couples, ever argue, right? You have conversations that are sometimes heated. Hello, we have the next generation rising up. Uh, You remember about my story, how many years it took us to have daughters in the Rendell family? So I'm just smitten. Every time I see little daughters, I'm like, oh. And then the granddaughter, I mean, come on, right? 
She's having fun. Oh, she needs a mic even. This is awesome. But what, one of the things we've started doing very practically in our marriage, whenever we're anxious and we're, you know, having one of those conversations, you know the kind of conversations I'm talking about? Yes. We've decided, you know what? We're going to take every thought and every word captive in prayer. So we've started, instead of saying things at each other, I mean to each other, you know what I mean? Let's start saying them to the Lord. And so I'm here to tell you, when you're anxious about a generation, say it to him. Call out to God and say, God, help me to help these young people. Now, I have a challenge for you. Pastor apparently likes when you get challenged. Here's a challenge and an assignment for you. Are you praying for a teenager? Are you praying for a teenager? If you are, write that name down right now. Write the name or multiple names down. Now, that teenager may be in your own home. Youth ministry in my house. It may be a neighbor's kid. It may be your cousin, your nephew. Write a teenager's name down because you know what? When you were a teenager, almost for sure somebody was praying for you, and here you are. So pray, pray, pray. I've had the privilege of sharing at the United Nations in Geneva. I got to speak at the big hall, not in the big assembly, but it was a big conference, and they asked me to talk about teenagers and the difference they can make in the world, and I challenged the United Nations. I said, you know, to you, everybody under 18 is a child. But we all know that's not true. If you have a 14 or 15-year-old at home, you know they're not quite a child, not quite an adult. They're what I call a hybrid. Now, if you're into cars, you know that it's almost impossible to buy a hybrid today. There's a queue waiting to buy hybrids. They're trending. Well, I'm here to tell you teenagers are like hybrids. They have so much potential to make a difference in the world. And actually, if you think about it, the word teenager and the word adolescence, they're very, very new in human history. Only in the last 100 years or so are those words being used. In other words, for most of human history, post-puberty, you were an adult. And God, if you look at Scripture carefully, we're going to look at this a little bit. God loves using teenagers for his purposes, for his plans. Now, as a Youth for Christ guy that works with teenagers around the world at the UN, I challenge them about something else. The UN often steps into disaster response places, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, all these kinds of things. And I've had the incredible privilege to be in those spaces on behalf of teenagers. And I said to the United Nations, you might want to write this down because it's an interesting thought about the church and its role with young people. Teenagers are the most overlooked victims and the most underutilized assets. The most overlooked victims and the most underutilized assets. What do I mean by that? If you're in a disaster scene and you see a teenager standing by the river where his parents were just blitzed, you might just pass him by because he's standing there. He looks okay. He's standing there. But the guy's in shock because he just watched his parents get blitzed. So how do we turn a victim into an asset? Listen carefully. We give him a mission. We give him a mission. Teenagers are being victimized all over the world by a lot of tough stuff. Being a teenager today is rough. There's a lot of heavy bombardment going on, a lot of spiritual warfare for sure. And actually, that spiritual warfare spills over to if you're a leader of youth ministry, you're going to feel it as well. It's powerful. But we give them a mission. So when I, when I go to disaster areas, I'll say to the teenagers, can you help me unload trucks? Can you help me distribute food and water? And it literally, I've had teenagers say to me, you saved my life because I was a walking zombie before you came and said, can you help? Can you be a part of this? Some years ago, uh, YFC, we interviewed some of the big internet search engine people. And we talked to them about what are the top three things that are searched by teenagers? Not just Google, but other, other search engines. What are the top three things? If you search this, you're not going to find it because these, these engines, these companies are embarrassed by what are the top three things that are searched. Are you ready for this? Number one is, how do I kill myself? Number one, how do I take my life? The tragedy of that is, listen to this, every 40 seconds on planet Earth, somebody gives away the greatest gift that God has ever given us, and it's often young people. Often young people that are suicidal. And why are they suicidal? Not because they want to die, but they can't find a good reason to live. What's the role of the church? It's to introduce them to the way, the truth, and the life. The second thing they search, are you ready for this? This one's good. Is there a God? The Bible says eternity is in our hearts. And so all of us are always looking, is there's got to be something more than just me on this planet, something bigger than me, something transcendent. 
And the third thing, very sadly, you can imagine this, probably some of you guessed it, it's pornography. Pornography is the greatest facade for relationship on the planet. So what's happening with this generation? They want a good reason to live. They want to know who should I serve, who can I worship. And thirdly, they're desperate for relationship. And that's what good churches are all about. Effective youth ministry is when you form community and give young people a place to belong. So a few years ago, God gave me a crazy opportunity to minister to one particular teenager. I was in Denver, Colorado. We were living there at the time. And God said, I need you to do something strange tonight. I was in a week of board meetings. YFC board meetings, not boring meetings, although sometimes those are boring. But I was getting ready for it. My wife was out the evening. I had our two little daughters at home. And I got this weird prompting from the Holy Spirit. You ever had a weird prompting from the Holy Spirit? Where you're like, that's so weird, it had to be the Holy Spirit, right? And I thought, God, you're confused. Anybody here ever thought God was confused? Come on, guys. I know some of you thought God was confused. God's never confused. It's us not figuring it out. But the prompting was this. It was weird. God said, tonight, I want you to go get a haircut. Like, what? And I kind of needed one, but it wasn't the time. Like, I'm getting ready for a board meeting. I'm looking after my girls. It's 7 o'clock in the evening. Like, this is not the time. And it's, it kept pestering me. You need to go get a haircut. So I said to my girls, okay, girls, dad's got to get a haircut. And they're looking at me like, really? They were about 10, 10, 11 years old. Okay, so away we went. And we went to a barbershop I'd never been to before, very close to our house. And there was one girl in there working, cutting hair, and she was waiting for a customer. I think that was me. There was nobody in there. So I walked in. I sat down. She put the robe over me. And then a crazier thing happened. Words came out of my mouth that I didn't know were going to come out of my mouth. Have you ever had that problem? Yeah, when the Holy Spirit says something. And then you do know that words are like toothpaste, right? Once they come out, you can't put them back in. And I'm sitting there, and I say, she just about start cutting my hair. She's got the scissors out. She's working. And I say, what are you doing with the grace of God in your life? What? I'm like, where did that come from? And then she started to sob. And I'm here to tell you that a crying barber is not a safe barber. Am I right? So, and, and then I was like, okay, God, now I know why we're here. Because the next thing she said was, I've been running from his grace all my life. And so I said to her, just stop for a moment and pull out your phone. Could everybody wave your phone at me? Wave your phone at me. In church, we don't usually do this, but I'm here to tell you, wave your phone at me. And you all know that if, you, if you're working to try to find your way somewhere, it works even here in Nairobi, there's something called GPS. What does GPS stand for? Come on, scientists. Global Positioning System. And I said to her, when you are using your GPS and you get lost, what does your GPS do? Does it say, you silly fool, where do you think you're going? No, it gets very gentle, goes, rerouting. And it's sort of a gentle voice, right? It's rerouting. Well, and I said to her, listen, God has a special system. It's called God's grace positioning system. A whole new form of GPS. And when we got off track, when we get off track from what God wants us to be doing all along, guess what God does? He doesn't yell at us and say, you silly fool, where do you think you're going? He says, Rerouting, And it's gentle because we know God doesn't yell at us from storms and whatever. He comes in a gentle whisper and he says, rerouting. And then he brings us right back to where he wanted us to be all along. And that girl was really sobbing now. And I said, I think I don't need a haircut. But thank you. God bless you. And we followed up with her. And now my girls had a little lesson in ministry. There was apprenticing going on. Did you catch that? But in that moment, this 18-year-old girl learned about God's grace. So be available to teach teenagers about God's grace because when they find out about God's grace, there's no greater asset in teen ministry than a surrendered teenager. The devil's greatest worry is a willing teenager. Surrender to God. I like living in such a way that when I wake up in the morning, the devil goes, "Uh uh-oh. You ever think about that? When you wake up in the morning, when you're surrendered, when you're willing to serve the king of kings, the devil goes, "Uh uh-oh. And I love that. I also live in such a way that my guardian angels are never bored, but that's another conversation. I've climbed some of the biggest mountains in the world doing ministry with teenagers. It's amazing. So teenagers today, what's it like to be a teenager today? Let's talk about some really cool, positive things. It's challenging, but no generation before this one ever has been so connected, so informed, so tech savvy, and so able to influence across borders. Did you hear that? They have so much capacity to be an asset to the church. So, church, how do we leverage and steward this generation for the kingdom of God? 
Let's be practical here. If you have a, a paper Bible, hold up your paper Bible for a minute. Anybody got a paper Bible? That's really old school. Now I'm telling you how old I am. And around the page of your paper Bible, if you open it, there's some white space. What's that white space called? Margin. To do youth ministry, you need to have margin in your life because they're often interrupting us. Ever, anybody ever been interrupted by a teenager with a great idea or they got to go somewhere or they need help with this or whatever? You got to have margin in your life. Jesus had margin. If you read the Gospels, almost every single ministry opportunity Jesus had in Scripture, we would call an interruption. Am I right? Somebody, son of David, have mercy. He's on his way to somewhere, and Jairus comes up. He's on his way to somewhere to Jairus' house, and a woman comes up and touches his robe. It's just nonstop interruptions. That's a good description of youth ministry, by the way. But you have to have margin in your life to be able to respond to them. Let's look at some exemplary teenagers in Scripture. I'm excited about this because these scriptural teenagers are actually in your church today. They're in your church today. Let's start with Mary. The virgin mother of Jesus. Remember when she was standing at the cross as an adult, the centurion who's standing at the foot of the cross says, truly this man was the son of God. When she heard that, I'm sure she said in her heart, you know what? I know that for certain because I was a virgin mother. I know this for certain. And she was dependent on God. She was surrendered to God. Something I don't like about the Christmas story when we unpack it in church, we often talk a lot about the virgin Mary, but we forget to talk about the virgin Joseph. Am I right? What about that guy? That guy's like my hero. Virginity goes both ways, ladies and gentlemen. And we often don't talk about that. Another beautiful part of the Christmas story, beautiful part of the Christmas story, every teenager needs an Elizabeth. Remember Elizabeth in that story? Mary is scared out of her mind. She's pregnant. She doesn't even know how. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Okay, how does that work? Right? Right? I mean, imagine how scary that is. Your 13, 14, 15-year-old girl, she was young. And she's like, okay, whatever, whatever, I'm in, because you're in, and you're calling me to it, I'm in. But she had to be, there had to be some fright in her, but she surrendered, and God gives her Elizabeth. I want to give you another homework assignment. Who are you and Elizabeth for? So the first, you've already answered that first question, for that list of teenagers that you already put down. Who are you a Paul for in the life of a Timothy? Are you standing in the gap for teenagers? So King David, remember David, the giant slayer? I don't know if you ever noticed this before, but he was an overlooked son. Remember that part of the story? Jesse doesn't even remember he's got a younger son. Samuel comes. He's going to anoint the next king. He brings out all of his boys. And Samuel goes, is this all of them? And Jesse's like, oh, yeah, the younger one. Who's out. Can you imagine being that son? It feels really warm and heartwarming to know how much your dad loves you. Huh? But what does God do with that? In, in that situation, God redeems that situation. And that same overlooked son is the son of God. He knows God as his father. And he stands in front of a giant and says, I'm taking your head in the glory of God, for the glory of God. So teenagers, some, some of them may be in a rough situation, but God can redeem them and use them for that. David says, the Lord saved me from a lion and a bear, and he will save me from the Philistines. He wasn't doubtful. There was no doubt in David's mind. He might, maybe, possibly, I hope this works with the three stones and the five stones and the sling and all. No, he's like, he will save me. What about Joseph, the son of Jacob? He was a spoiled young man, spoiled by a doting father. But God humbled him through some very serious circumstances. Through it all, suddenly, he becomes the COO of Egypt and saves the world from starvation. Did you catch that about Joseph? It's an amazing story how God turned it around. Daniel, he was a slave. Daniel was the consultant for the most powerful king of that time, Nebuchadnezzar. And he interprets a dream. And then the king, I don't think we understand. When a king, imagine a king saying this. Here we are, Daniel 2, 47. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Young people can have influence in the courtroom, in the palace. Do we believe that? That's what I said at the UN, by the way. That we need to get the voice of teenagers, the teen voice. We need to amplify it somehow and get it in here. What about Esther, a young Jewish beauty queen? 
She was so desperately dependent on God that when she had this mission for such a time as this, I need to go to the king. It could cost me my life. She said, everybody needs to pray. But she didn't just say, everybody please pray, please pray and fast. She said, I'm going to pray and fast. When teenagers pray and fast, I'm here to tell you, it is powerful because they pray and fast believing with great faith and great expectations. Sometimes we as adults pray with great faith. Oh yeah, God could do this. And no expectations, but he's not likely to. Am I right? But teenagers lean right in and say, God, you've got this. I believe. Are we raising up a generation of Christian young people who are willing to sacrifice for their Savior? Get them excited about what God wants to do in and through them. Um, how can teenagers and children minister to us? I want to close with a couple quick stories about this. In YFC Trinidad and Tobago, little islands in the Caribbean, I had the privilege of going there. And Youth for Christ there, they do a whole weekend nationally like almost every church in the country, they teach children to pray. Teaching children to pray, encouraging them to pray, teaching them to pray scripture, psalms, hymns, poetry, art, and they spend two days teaching them to pray. And then some very brave pastors, some very brave pastors call the children up on stage Sunday morning and say, what did the Lord say to you? And I was in a mega church in Trinidad, big church, five, 600 people in that standard. That's a mega, mega church. And a 10-year-old boy comes up. The pastor put his arm around him and said, Son, what did the Lord say to you? And the little boy says, uh, Pastor, I don't think we pray enough for our prime minister. And the pastor's like, Okay. We were told in Scripture we're supposed to pray for those in authority. Let's pray. Uh, pastor, before we pray, Scripture also says that we need to humble ourselves before we pray. That's a good word, son. Let's, let's, let's humble ourselves. Uh, pastor, I just think we all need to kneel. This wasn't a kneeling church. You know, some churches kneel a lot, and other churches, you know, a few of us kneel. This wasn't a kneeling church. And bless that senior pastor. He's like, okay, everybody, let's get on our knees. And a 10-year-old boy led them in a humble prayer on behalf of the whole church, on behalf of the kingdom of God for their prime minister. Do we believe that children can lead us in ministry? It's powerful. Um, and let me tell you one more story that's embarrassing to me. Anybody ready for embarrassing stories? We all have embarrassing stories, but here... Here's a significantly embarrassing one. Um, we were on a prayer walk through Caracas, Venezuela. Can you all say Caracas? Very good. I love it here because you guys can roll your R's and stuff. So in Caracas, Venezuela, we're walking through the city doing a prayer walk with about 25 Canadian teenagers. We stood out big time. Caracas, Venezuela, very, uh, the people are very brown, very dark, and these Canadians were not. And we're walking through some of the toughest areas in the city, and I'm praying that we'd be safe. And they're just praying for the people around them. We had a wonderful time. We had a prayer session before we left. And now we're on the subways, on the trams. And I was carrying, you know where this is going. You're going to think you know where this is going. I was carrying a backpack with 26 Canadian passports. And I had a little hip bag with my passports in it. And everybody thought everything would be safe with me because I'm an ex-police officer, an ex-bodyguard. I've been a missionary a long time in these areas. I know my way around. We're going out of a subway in a really rough area of town, and all of a sudden, two teenagers, not from our group, Caracas teenagers, they jump right in front of me, and they jam themselves right into the escalator, and I start falling over them, and now I'm worried not about backpack or anything. I'm worried somebody's going to get hurt because I've got 25 people coming in on top of me, and suddenly another teenager, not from our group, jumps on my back, and he unclips my hip bag, and gone, and the two underneath me roll out, gone. I've just been what? Robbed. What do you think I was feeling in that moment? Mad. I actually, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I was actually mad at God. Because I said, God, I'm here trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to minister to teenagers in Venezuela with Canadian teenagers. And three Venezuelan teenagers just ripped me off. What are you doing about that? Like, I was, I was like so, I, it takes me a lot to get angry. But this is like, come on, right? And here's the fun part of the story. A 14-year-old boy on our trip, his name was Luke. He comes up as soon as, Jordan, what happened? I said, well, they got my stuff. They stole my stuff, but all of your passports are fine, but they stole my stuff. And Luke says, well, let's pray. Guys, I'm here to tell you, this is the embarrassing part of the story because I'm the pastor, I'm speaking this morning. Out of like a thousand possible things that I was thinking in that moment, maybe thousand and one, let's pray. Because I was skeptical. Like, pray for what? You know, pray for my anger issues. Pray for It wasn't pray to get my stuff back. But Luke's like, Jordan, you gave us a whole seminar about prayer. Remember, the, how old is Luke? Yeah, 
He's a teenager, 14, 15 years old. And he says, Jordan, you told us that it's way more exciting when we pray specifically. So what did you lose? I said, well, you know, my mind's, okay, we lost my passport, we lost my son's passport, and my Venezuelan ID papers. Those are hard to get. You got to stand in long queues, wait for days, and it's a mess. He says, okay, we got this. So he gets on his knees. He's like, dear Jesus, we thank you for Jordan. We thank you for his love for you. And we just pray that for your glory, you would return his passport, his son's passport, and his Venezuelan ID papers, because in Jesus' name, we believe you are capable, you are mighty, you are positive, you can do this. Amen. And when he hang up with Jesus, when he said amen, something crazy happened. So during that prayer, by the way, I'm like, okay, let's go with his faith, not with mine, because I got nothing. He's praying, and suddenly he says, amen, my phone rings. My phone, my cell phone had been hanging on my belt, and when they grabbed my, my, my hip belt, my phone had fallen off. My phone rings, and a guy says, are you Jordan Rendell? I said, yes, I am. Guy says, I've got some of your papers here, some of your documents. I'm thinking, I'm still skeptical. I'm like, okay, let's negotiate. I'll pay you what you want. I'm thinking this is a setup. Somebody's trying to, you know, get my, make a deal with me. The guy said, no, 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 no. This is the federal police. I'm like, whoa. Okay, and they said, we're just outside of the train terminal. We saw three guys come running out. Just come over and we'll, we'll, we'll connect with you. Okay, so we go over there and all the teenagers, 26 Canadian teenagers are following me over. And Luke's like, yes, you know, because something, something big's going down. And we get over to the police and I said, so what, what happened? They said, we're always, this is the most dangerous, like bus terminals are always dangerous. Train stations are dangerous. And we saw these three guys run out. So we just watched them and they opened up your hip bag. They were looking through it. We tried to sneak up on them. And as we got closer, boom, they saw us gone, running. And as they were running, your hip bag was flying around. They were running, and we couldn't catch them. But we picked up some documents. Sir, I think this is your passport. I think this is your son's passport. I think this is your Venezuelan ID paper. And the most incredible thing that fell out of there was one of your business cards with your cell phone on it. Huh? Why did God answer that prayer? Because a teenager prayed and he had a lot of faith. But there's another layer to it. I believe God answered that prayer because a teenager's prayer and faith, God wanted to use that to minister to me and to challenge me in my lack of faith and my lack of understanding as a senior missionary on the mission field. But I love that story because how old was Luke? So the point of this whole message, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is that teenagers are to set an example for the whole church, not just for their peers. How do we release them into ministry? How do we help them get out of church as our missionaries? We spend a lot of time keeping them in church, keeping them in church, keeping them in church. And don't get me wrong, we want them here. We want them to be trained up and nurtured in the admonition of the Lord. But so that they can get out there to their schools and minister. So we have a youth group at church, but your youth ministry is every teenager represented by every school represented by your youth group. Did you get that? That's your youth ministry. That's the impact of your church is every teenager that teenager from your church has contact with. Mary, David, Daniel, Esther, they're here. They're in your church. Teenagers are not just the responsibility of the church. They are responsible for the church. Man, that's, that's big if you think about it. But they want to be given consequential responsibility in the church. They want to serve the church. Teenagers are the church. They're not the future of the church for goodness sakes. They have a role within the church if we release them into it. Sometimes, anybody ever found churches that seem tired? I say it's often because they haven't found that alternative, alternative energy source that God gives them, which is teenagers. Put them in harness and let them go. 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So Trinity Church, let's together raise up and release an exemplary and godly generation. And young people, go ye into all the world and go with God and with our blessing. Amen. Be encouraged.